But you want to, this is for the people who won't be able to see the TVs. This is the people who will listen to the radio. And this is how a certain round of the fight will sound over radio. Go ahead. Ali comes out to meet Floyd. And Floyd starts to retreat. If Floyd goes back an inch farther, he'll wind up in a ringside seat. Floyd swings with the left. Floyd swings with the right. Look at the kid carry the fight. Floyd keeps backing, but there's not enough room. It's a matter of time. There Ali lowers the boom. Now Ali lands with the right. What a beautiful swing. And the punch lifts Floyd clean out of the ring. Floyd is still rising. And the ref wears a frown. For he can't start counting till Floyd comes down. Now Floyd disappears from view. The crowd is getting frantic. But our radar stations have picked him up. He's somewhere over the Atlantic. Who would have thought when they came to the fight that they would witness the launching of a human satellite? You yes, were. the crowd did not dream when they laid down their money that Ali would retire, Floyd and Sonny. You may not have he heard... Yeah, what you think about that? I think you're... <laughs> I think you're extraordinarily brilliant. That was Ali and, of course, Howard Cosell. What a great relationship, an amazing relationship they had. And that leads us right into our next guest, the legendary sports writer from the Houston Chronicle and Houston Post, Mickey Herskowitz, is back with us. And so great to have him to talk about this because he was a biographer of Howard Cosell. He wrote a book about his life. And, Mickey, tell us about that relationship because that, that was really something special. Robert, it really was. It was not just a symbiotic relationship. It was the odd couple personified. Uh, Ali and Cosell had these towering egos that you would think would clash constantly and drive a huge wedge. Uh, Those egos wouldn't have fit in any spaceship we know about. But they were perfect. Each guy set up the other. Uh, it was hard to tell who was the straight man and who was the comedian. But they got along so great, and they recognized instantly that they were terrific show business and how, how they each promoted the other. So they were terrific on the air, and Ali was always threatening to, in a dainty kind of way, you'd see two or three fingers over Howard's head, threatening to pull off his toupee, but you don't think he ever did. But the funny thing is, they they never saw each other or had any contact outside of their performances in front of a camera. Cosell told me once that Ali had never invited him to a meal. And, of course, that was Cosell, I think, looking at it from his perspective, how strange that Ali had never invited him into his house or offered to have a lunch or dinner with him, invited him. But Cosell didn't either. Cosell felt like it was a gesture, I guess, that Ali needed to make. And and given the the stature and the eccentricities and egomaniacal characteristics each had, you can understand that they would not have been social butterflies together. But I remember so vividly when and watching the documentaries the last few days, the scenes where Cosell was commenting, he not only dreaded the fight for Ali, thought he would lose, thought he was going to be terribly overmatched by the young and powerful and aggressive George Foreman, who was almost a decade younger than Ali, and Muhammad aging and fading and near the end of what had been this legendary career. I think Howard actually feared that Muhammad would be physically damaged in that fight. And I'm not referring to any headshots, because if you remember from the scenes that you saw and the brilliant strategy that Ali used, he had Foreman just wailing at his stomach and his ribs and his sides and he had trained that way his sparring partners were hired to beat him up as much as they could on his torso but Ali covered up and I don't think Foreman ever really got a clean shot at his head so it wasn't that wasn't what caused the brain damage and the Parkinson's and the uh illness and disease that so marked the final years of the 
wonderfully joyful, uh, Ali. But uh, it was the Joe Frazier fights that did that. Well, one of the things that connects Ali to Houston is the entire Vietnam episode where he decides that he is not going to go fight those Viet Cong. That happened here. That happened in Houston. Tell, tell that story. And, and, and you were a part of that. You're absolutely right. I was actually I was there the day that Ali refused to take the historic step at the post office, which was also at that time the office for the draft board, to take the step forward to be inducted into the U.S. Army on San Jacinto Street. And I'll never forget it because there were maybe 18 to 20 kids pretty much that in that age range being inducted and pleading with Ali to come with them in the hopes that they would all wind up in the same boot camp. And he toyed with them and teased them and joked with them. And he, I mean, he was totally upbeat. There wasn't anything depressed about him. But when it came time, he called each young draft recruit's name and he stepped forward and they swore him in and they called Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, and he stood in place a guard stepped forward and put his hand on his shoulder, and they actually had handcuffs. I don't think they put them on, but let him out of the room. And I looked around, and there were some of these recruits, 18 years old, were literally crying, knowing that Ali faced maybe three to five years in prison, but wasn't going to be with them in the Army. I would occasionally catch a plane with Ali, when I'd meet him on the road, just by chance most of the time, but I was in and out of Chicago with the baseball team. The Astros played the Cubs, and I'd come home on my own for some reason. Maybe I had a book I was working on, and I'd stay over. At least twice, three times, I sat with Ali on the plane, and we visited all the way to Houston. I remember one time he was under enormous fire. One of the mistakes and myths that I heard repeated endlessly, and some of the commentators were reviewing Ali's history, they made it sound like he had already won the hearts of America in the 1960s with his stand against the war. And the fact is, he was probably the most hated person in the country, maybe the most hated and maybe the most popular. But at the same time, as contradictory as that is, Cosell in a national network poll was named the most popular and the most disliked broadcaster in the country. But anyway, we were on the plane one day, and nothing ever dragged Ali down. The idea of going to prison didn't bother him. He thought it would just be a new experience. We're on the plane, and it hasn't taken off from O'Hare Airport in Chicago yet. And we're chatting away, and the airline hostess walked down the aisle, and she didn't give him a second look. She didn't know who he was. But she walked past us in that nice, brisk, authoritative stride that airline hostesses have. And over her shoulder, without actually turning her head, just, just a notch maybe, she looked out of the corner of her eye and she said to Ali and myself, fasten your seatbelts, we're about to take off. And Ali yelled after her, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> and... The airline hostess never broke stride. Again, a little half-inch turn, and over her shoulder, she said to Ali, Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Ali loved it. Anyway, later, the next time, not many months after that, I went to New York and started a sports magazine called Jock. I was going to do a cover story, and did, with Ali, about going to prison, and the cover photograph was Ali actually behind prison bars. It was such an experience. I, I met him with a limousine. He's, he stayed, I had a suite for him for three days and nights at the St. Regis Hotel. And we, we hung out most of that time. We got Ali to do the story and it was amazing because he did it for $500. That's how broke he was. And that money wasn't for Muhammad, it was for his lawyer. The lawyer made the deal, and he wanted $500. And Ali just was glad to come and get a trip to New York. So he brought a buddy, not a girl, brought a guy friend, and they were sitting in the back. I sat up front with the driver. He was going to have three days in New York at the hotel and a free trip, and all his expenses paid. And he was going to do a commercial for me for the magazine. All that and the, and the story for 500 bucks. And we are in the limo. And we're going to go right to the studio to uh, do the commercial. 
and then check into the hotel. And I said, Champ, we've got about three hours before the commercial. I said, I can, you know, you can drop your bags off at the hotel or go wherever you'd like. And he said, let's go through Harlem. So we had this big, long, black limousine, and we drive through Harlem, and nobody knows he's coming. I mean, there's no parade scheduled. There's no invitation gone out that Muhammad Ali is going to appear in Harlem on a certain day. But we start driving through the area, and every block or so, Ali would jump out. He ran into a barber shop, said hello to everybody, shook hands. He ran into a sandwich shop and shook hands and said hello. And then he went into a grade school, an elementary school. I finally had to climb three flights of stairs to find him and get him back <laughs> into the car because it, now it's time to do the commercial. And he gets to the back seat and I'm sitting with the, the you know the the driver and we're chatting and oh, he rolls down the window and by now it's unbelievable. The streets are lined. The sidewalks are eight deep. There are people, it's like the drums had been breaking the silence with the news that Muhammad Ali, the champion, uh, the heavyweight champion of the world, was driving through Harlem. And they came out of everywhere, buildings, offices, schools, playgrounds. I don't know where. They were, uh, they were, they were standing in the gutters of the street. They were standing on the sidewalk. They were waving and yelling. And Ali was leaning out of the back window, waving to people. And then as we as we drove out and drove off and sped up a little bit, Ali kind of sank back into the cushion of that long, sleek limousine. And he said, Mickey, you know what those people were yelling back there? And I said, no, champ, what? He said, they were yelling, look, there go Muhammad Ali with two white chauffeurs. <laughs> and I was the other chauffeur, obviously. <laughs> well, that's that's a great story. Was there anybody more electric than him? You covered sports for 50 years. Nobody can think of anybody that is more sort of effervescent. And just he had a thing about him, didn't he? There was a jubilation about Ali that was unmatched by any athlete we've ever known. Maybe Dizzy Dean came close, but he didn't have the, the megaphone that Ali had. It was so true, which has been said many times, that he was the best known person in the world. You could go into any village in Africa and say Muhammad Ali, or any town in Sweden, or the Fiji Islands, and they would know the name Ali, and would just look at you blankly if you said, George Washington or Ronald Reagan or John Kennedy. Ali was so inventive. He was clearly the greatest athlete of my lifetime. And I think maybe of all time, uh, I, I would put him up there with Jim Thorpe, Babe Ruth, and Bronco Nagurski. And of course, he had more fame and celebrity because he had more outlets. And imagine if he had, was at an, in his prime today with Twitter and uh, Instagrams and all of that, even with the old technology. I'm interviewing Ali for the uh, magazine piece we're doing. And Ali is showing me a box filled with letters that have been written to him from inmates in prisons around the country. And they're begging Ali to come to their prison if he got convicted. And it was like a compliment. They were actually in a bidding contest to get Ali <laughs> to serve his sentence wherever they were, Alcatraz or you name it. One guy, I'll never forget, wrote and promised him that they would get the cook in the kitchen to prepare him all kosher meals because <laughs> Muslims, like people of the Jewish faith, you know, kept kosher, didn't eat pig or pork. And one of the things Ali once said to me was, you know, Mickey, when you eat bacon or ham, you hear that crackle and that sizzle. You know what that is? I said, what, champ? He said, that's the maggots getting out. And I said, well, I think I'll pass on the bacon and pork from now on. <laughs> You know, with him, it was always something. So anyway, we're working on the story, and he tells me about they offer to keep kosher for him. But while we're talking, he's got crayons or pastels, I guess chalk, and artist paper and an artist's case on a table, and he's scribbling away. As we neared the end of the interview, I walked over and looked over his shoulder, and it was Ali 
knocking out Joe Frazier the next time they fought after he served his time in prison and they were able to fight each other. And he included that in the story in a poem. I can't, in no way I can remember and recite the poetry, but I I guarantee you it was poetry. Ali had Frazier on the canvas and he's standing over it. And I told Leroy Neiman, the artist about it, one of the great sports artists of our time, about it, and he asked if he could see it, and I showed it to him, and he looked at it, and he analyzed it. He said, his proportions are perfect. No artist could have done it any better. And he said he's nailed Frazier to a T. But what's fascinating about Ali is he's given himself all Caucasian features. And I, I had no idea what to make of that, but that was the picture. And it was a great drawing, and actually Leroy asked me if he could have it, and after we printed the issue, I gave that pastel sketch to Leroy Neiman, wished to hell I'd kept it myself. You know, he, he was so in, inherently gifted in ways for which he had no training at all. And he had to be the most photographed human being on the planet in his lifetime. I, I can't imagine anybody more so than Muhammad Ali and, and Mickey. I mean, it's just, it's thank you so much for giving us all these great stories and stuff, because you you know, we, we need people to be able to pass on his legend. And it's just great to hear this stuff. I I do need to tell you one more, if I may. Sure. When we went to the studio for the TV commercial, our magazine had been made possible by a public offering. So we had a company that was on the NASDAQ stock exchange. So we had a little money to play with. And so we had a real high-powered ad agency do commercials for Yogi Berra, Tom Seaver, Howard Cosell, and a couple of others, including Ali. The ad agency had the same gimmick. We ran the commercials on the Carson show, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. So we could only afford 15 seconds, but we ran it every night for a week with a different one of these famous New York celebrities, uh, Yogi Berra and Cosell and so on. The commercial went like this. We had the cover. This was July of 1969. The Mets were in last place, nine and a half games out of first. It was my idea as a gag. I had five of the Mets, Cleon Jones and Seaver and Jerry Grody, and I forget who the others were, but they were posed like the four or five guys you could see in the picture, raising the flag on Iwo Jima. We had built up the pitcher's mound at Shea Stadium. Gil Hodges wouldn't let us go on the field, so we had actually had to use the mound in the bullpen. But we built the mound up so they'd have room to stand on it, and they were posed just like the shot on Iwo Jima. And the key was the celebrity held the magazine in front of his face. And Cosell said, some people think that Jock Magazine is too brash and arrogant to make it in New York. And then he put down the magazine, you saw it was Cosell, and he said, but then they said the same thing about me. And so that was sort of the theme, and same thing with Yogi Berra. And when when they gave the copy to Ali, he looked at it and, and frowned, and he said to me, can I do my own? And the ad guys almost passed out. And I said, yeah, why not? And the ad guy said, well, listen, we're, it's costing us money. We're, we're, this is time. We don't have time for this. We've got to, you know, we've got to play this straight. And I said, it can't hurt anything. Let him take a shot at it. And so Ali took the magazine and he put it in front of his face. And I said, the magazine's name was Jock. That was kind of notorious at the time for the magazine name. He put the magazine in front of his face so he didn't know who it was. And without any rehearsal, without anything written down, you heard Ali's voice say, this may come as a great shock. And then he dropped the magazine and he said, but even Muhammad Ali reads Jock. (laughs) So there was the poet in him ever ready. Yeah, just fantastic. Well, Mickey Herskowitz, wonderful stories. Thanks so much for telling those stories and remembering Ali with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Robert. It was all my pleasure. I don't wrestle with an alligator. That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I don't tussle with a whale. I don't handcuff lightning, throw thunder in jail. That's bad. 
Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. <laughs>